constitutional, as you said. Luciano Hassan is a member of the Committee on Enforced uh, Disappearances at the UN. He's been chosen as the first rapporteur by the committee itself. It's also a lawyer of the Association Grandmothers of the May Square. He's also a teacher at the University in Buenos Aires. Luciano, in your double role as Argentinian, as an Argentinian who's, who's lived in, in, in first <coughs> person in uh, the justice in Argentina, and also some member of a committee of the UN, which has quite an impact and which also contributes or somehow complements the enforcement of universal jurisdiction. Do you think it is a tool that is needed? I mean, universal jurisdiction, is it needed? Yes, definitely. I think our experience in Argentina serves as proof of the need to have universal jurisdiction. Of course, it is a complicated response. What happened in Argentina was a process where different factors were involved. I could not list them all, of course, but it started out with the DEP, Commission Against the Disappearance of People. Those were the proofs for the first trial and the upcoming and, and the consecutive trials. Then we had the amnesty process, final uh, process. Then we had, as part of the impunity stage, but still we had some improvements when grandmothers started to look for their grandkids and he had a legal nuance and even um, a sanction or penalty nuance to them because there were some trials held during that stage then afterwards we had the trials for truth with the intervention of the inter-american court such as the Pakok case that was promoted by the SES. It is also interesting to note how, during that stage, new stakeholders start working, especially daughters and sons. They were new stakeholders trying to advocate human rights, so that was the following generation. And also what we call scratch marches in the fight against impunity, and then the claims for extradition by uh, Justice Garzón and other judges in Italy and France, which undoubtedly are main traits in our fight against impunity or pardons or amnesties. After extradition claims, we had some decrees or orders well, they said that all claims had to be rejected, had to be overridden. And I say this is a process because we've moved forward and we've moved backwards. And then we had a statement by the Congress where the laws were annulled or voided, then they were declared unconstitutional in court, and then in 2003, which clearly made a great impression in the country and led to a rough change in our quest for justice. That was a change in government where the Supreme Court was to be transformed or changed. They had to be much more committed, much more lawful, more focused on human rights. And this is paramount. There were a few political messages. Well, you could mention one, but there were several actually. And that was March 24th, 20, uh, 2004, with the symbolic delivery of the Navy school to the defenders of human rights, and also the speech by ex -president, uh, former President Kishmer and others who made a difference. But there were also a few political events throughout the first years which were very significant. Why 
Why am I saying this? Because uh, when we will discuss the Argentinian case tomorrow, things will change a lot. But the thing is, I'm not so. I'm not so interested in referring to the efficiency or efficacy of the universal jurisdiction. But I, I rather pose the following question: How and what are we going to use for that? For us, after that process, what we saw in Argentina, and I started working as a barrister for grandmothers back in 2013, when, when it was all starting out. So I live it in, in first person for, for the first years, from 2003 to 2007 or eight. It was the time of uncertainty, that was it. And what's interesting here is how could political willingness coexist. I'm referring to prosecution or criminal policy where they say there can be no impunity for these crimes, but then it coexisted with the legal system that could not find a way out to move forward. So uh, how come? That's the question that comes to mind. How come? It is weird. But I find it is difficult to find a, a criminal prosecution law in Argentina that is any more consistent than the one having to do with crimes against humanity during the military regime. Uh, of course, there have been extortion-based um, abductions. They used to be quite a problem back in 2000 and 2001. You could also argue uh, drug dealing or uh, vehicle dealing, vehicle dealing. But, but none of those laws have lasted for so long and had, have been so consistent. So the problem was we do not, did not have the landscape, the legal landscape, to push it forward as it was needed. First of all, we needed to have a trial. We did not have one case, one apparent case. Those were mass cases. So I guess one of the main challenges ahead of us would be how do states or legal systems, how do they face this kind of very complicated crimes? Why are they so complicated? Those are not financial crimes. Where, well, those are complicated because of the number of figures and the need to have experts coming in from different fields of expertise, accountants. This could also be the case here, but still, this is complicated because times passed, because those were mass murders, mass crimes. We're talking about thousands of enforced disappearances, 30,000 according to the calculation in human rights organizations. And what about disappearance of victims and, and corpses, which for the legal proceedings is, is a problem. And also the fact that these crimes were concealed. So we might wonder what was going on and what's still going on to some extent, because it is still a problem for our justice system in Argentina and some other places in, in Latin America specifically because our proceedings tend to be very weak. Not just the proceedings, actually, but the legal system as a whole. Well, first of all, we need to think of the integration of the legal system or judicial system, what we call the legal family. That's the name we give it in Argentina. They are conservative, they are functional, and they try to prosecute mainly young, poor criminals, both formally and informally, because, uh, well, in that system, we can also have concealed or underground prosecution of young, poor people. That's kind of off-the-record prosecutions. And they've been operational for the crime, for the dictator's crime or dictatorship crimes. And what about people and structures? Well, as for structures, those have been designed a century and a half ago. Although it were they were originally conceived two or three hundred uh, uh, years ago, sorry, during the 
conquest, and mainly they are focusing on poor young people. So they are not efficient. They delegate all kind of investigations in to, to the police. The police forces, the, the law enforcement has not been democratized in Latin America. They have not undergone the reforms that are so much needed. And so it is on a structure which has been designed for the incarceration without, with or without a conviction of the least favored social classes. This process took us five years. How did we channel it? Well, nowadays we have some 10, 12 simultaneous trials. Uh, one finishes, the other one starts. And there have been hundreds of convictions to those accountable for the military dictatorship. So, my analysis, apart from the political willingness, also how the Supreme Court has issued several rulings that were very important after 2003, but also how the public perception often has been changed, despite the difficult landscape but that are not ideal. But back in 2007, we have an expert group or a task force created for the prosecution of the dictatorship crimes, which adds up to all other positive factors that I mentioned. And to some extent, in my opinion, made it possible to channel this process or justice process. Now, let me leave Argentina and try and analyze everything having to do with other places in the world and universal jurisdiction. Uh, from the Committee Against Enforced Disappearances of the United Nations, it is my task to study current cases in different countries. So these problems we used to see in Argentina uh, around 2003 all the way to 2008 uh, can be seen today in countries like Colombia, Mexico, or Iraq, countries that have actually ratified the convention and from which we have received urgent claims, urgent actions from the committee on some, some sort of international habeas corpus that allow the committee to act vis-a-vis -vis an enforced disappearance of an individual to quickly uh, question the state about uh, the physical integrity of, of that person and requesting information on their whereabouts. So it's a, a, a humanitarian measure, but it, it also fulfills all the measures of the Convention for the Protection Against Enforced Disappearances. And in those investigation processes, we follow uh, the same logic. We don't do any investigation, per se. In certain countries, uh, DNA databases have been created as if they were the magical solution. And the sole reply they give uh, families of the victims are, give us a DNA sample, and if a body is found, we will match it to the database. But there is no actual search. And these are supposed to be current disappearances where the possibility of finding the victim alive is still good. So I would say that the same problem we encounter when it comes to a state's obligation to investigate, judge, and uh, uh, apply penalties to violations of human rights like enforced disappearances or others like torture, which also comes from the Commission Against Torture, etc., is an obligation. And, uh, a heavy one at that in terms of case law and international courts of law. But it also has conventional influence because it's part of many subscribed conventions. It is, however, also a problem we can find within universal jurisdiction. And perhaps the question we should ask ourselves, and this would be the perfect forum to do so, is uh, maybe unanswered today, but uh, the question we should ask ourselves is, do we want states to exercise their universal jurisdiction in the defense of the rights of people or victims of crimes against humanity anywhere in the world to efficiently struggle against impunity? Do we want that? And how do we achieve it? These countries that can actually not guarantee investigations in their own national territory 
Are they actually capable of exercising this right abro abroad in other countries? And why is this important? We might say, well, if some of these countries can do so, we can uh, see some light at the end of the tunnel in terms of impunity. But I would say that rather than going there, we need to uh, make universal uh, jurisdiction more democratic, because one of the hurdles we've come up with in international law and with the international persecution of crimes affecting all humanity, uh, anywhere in the world, is the selectiveness we find. That's one of the hurdles, and that's one of the criticisms made on the function of on the international court of law. Persecuted, no, sorry, persecuted individuals belong to states that some way or another have fallen off international coverage. Countries that may have been allies of, uh, of other powerful countries and for some reason they ceased to be allies of these powerful countries, thus opening a space for uh, the criminal persecution of their leaders to be effectively practiced in a court of law. So we could run a small comparative analysis and ask who is unable to exercise international jurisdiction. Well, Spain could when Judge Garzon was in office or when uh, Lola was in office, but it looks like Spain is no longer empowered to do so. Argentina is in some cases exercising international jurisdiction. Well, basically because of the experience we have gathered in the past 10 years despite the shortcomings of our own uh, criminal law system. But experience in the past few years allows Argentina to exercise universal jurisdiction. And I would say that the Spanish experience is somehow related to other previous cases that gave you the experience and the capability to face this kind of complex crimes. France, Germany, Holland, Belgium have done so in the past. I would say that the challenge is for other countries to exercise it too. And this is one of the keys to counter pressure that might come from, thir from, from other countries. Because if we have dozens of countries that can exercise universal jurisdiction, it will become harder and harder for a powerful state to put pressure on a less powerful one, because we will have a legal system in the, ex in the uh, country uh, that is uh, trying to exercise it. And uh, ex exercising pressure on one country and on 10 countries is a very different story. A different story. And one of the main challenges this kind of movement needs to face is the creation of specialized tax units or specialized prosecution units, like the Committee Against Enforced Disappearances is finding out as we analyze reports from different states, we're paying close attention to the way in which uh, countries organize in their struggle against organized crime. For instance, when we analyzed Uruguay, we recommended that they create a specialized uh, prosecution unit. And we particularly pointed out uh, the functioning of the organization in Argentina or in the Netherlands, which is a very interesting organization. And they do exercise international jurisdiction. So these specialized units that uh, might have better conditions to investigate cases, not only domestically, but also exercising universal jurisdiction, could be seen as a tool for efficiency. Uh, let's go further and imagine we have 10 or even eight specialized uh, prosecutor offices that can exchange experiences and work in complementary uh, conditions when the political landscape, when the real politics will not allow for a legal system in a specific country to exercise universal jurisdiction on a particular individual. And they can act as a group. I would say these are areas to explore, mostly related to uh, public policy standards, basically. 
international uh, human right protection bodies, for instance, uh, could focus on the existence of the specialized units or the capabilities of different uh, state bodies to uh, assist victims, uh, to provide uh, witness protection programs. These are important aspects domestically, but also in universal jurisdiction. As a matter of fact, these subjects grow increasingly complex. When uh, somebody has to provide a statement as a witness in the jurisdiction of a different country, it might grow even more complex because um, there are logistical aspects that involve transportation, either of the witness or the official taking the statement. And this witness goes back to their own country, and they're further away from the country exercising universal jurisdiction. So protection is not at, at hand reach, and this person is uh, uh, virtually unprotected. So all this witness protection programs, etc., is a subject that will have to be dealt with, as well as the capability to identify a victim's remains, not only forensically, but also in DNA databases. These are fundamental aspects, but not the sole answer. They need to be one more method for public policies to uh, enforce uh, domestic investigations and the exercise of universal jurisdiction. And last but not least, as it still exists in many areas in the world, the need to uh, uh, take this kind of crimes off the hands of military justice. My final message would be that if we want to legitimate universal jurisdiction, more countries need to be enabled to exercise it. Somehow, the concept is we need to make universal jurisdiction more democratic. We need to broaden its scope so that international criminal law will no longer be in the hands of a few central countries. We should extend those capabilities to developing countries or to countries that are somehow at the edge of the world, so to speak. Thank you. We aim to reverse the state of things, but debate has to come first. Well, we had plenty of uh, questions uh, for you, Luciano, but trying to summarize them up into a single question, Let's say that governments or states subscribe agreements uh, and then they completely uh, breach these agreements, like the United Nations uh, Enforced Disappearance Committee. Can it bind states to enact its uh, principles or its articles? And uh, who is supposed to complement that role? Well, on how binding committee decisions are. Well, it depends on the mechanisms used. When the committee has issued recommendations to Spain in the framework of the dialogue held after the submission of the Spanish report, well, those recommendations are not as binding as a legal decision when an individual file is uh, submitted to the committee. The problem is that the Spanish state has not acknowledged the committee in its capacity. And that's why it is so difficult for those of you who are struggling for universal jurisdiction. It would be very important for Spain to acknowledge its competent, uh, the competence of uh, uh, the commission in the framework of Article 31. And the other part of the question was, yes, precisely, how can we match this to universal jurisdiction? Well, precisely. They're complementary because the struggle against impunity is a process. And it, well, you have to go different paths. As a matter of fact, I dare say that uh, in Argentina, uh, uh, the rejection for universal jurisdiction and the requests for extradition did not lead to uh, uh, bringing those uh, perpetrators to justice, but it was effective in a way. So one could say, 
What could say? Efficiency for impunity, perhaps not necessarily for universal jurisdiction. Even when it fails, universal jurisdiction can be affected in the struggle against impunity. So we're clearly dealing with complementary processes. And